Good morning and welcome to worship. God has promised us, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always. Let us worship God. And we open by singing, To God be the glory. done great things. We praise you for your persistent love for us and for the world. Creator Father, help us to see the wonders of your love in creation and to respect your creation, to be open to the joy of your blessing as we care for creation and the precious gifts of earth in this season of harvesting. Holy Spirit, Open our hearts to the wonders of your love in scripture. Stories of ordinary, diverse, flawed people just like us. By your amazing grace and providence woven into your plan of salvation as they trust you. And as we read and wonder, touch our hearts to trust you also. Lord Jesus, thank you for your self-giving love shown in all its compassionate fullness on the cross and in all its transforming power in your glorious resurrection. 
Father, Son, Holy Spirit, open our lives to the joy and peace and wonder of your glorious love as we worship you. Forgive us for when we have allowed our lives to focus so narrowly on worries or passing preoccupations that we are blind to love. You lo your love in our hearts and the love you send us through other people. In these days to come, give us courage to love and to let love transform us and touch our hearts deeply. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and together aloud we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Good morning, girls and boys. I hope you're all well and happy. I wonder if you ever played one of those games where someone blindfolds you and you have to let them lead you while you can't see, you're blindfolded. It's a game where you learn to trust because you can't see where you're going, so you have to trust that the other person isn't going to let you bump into anything or fall over or trip or anything like that. Games like that can really make us laugh and be a lot of fun. And afterwards, you often feel much closer to your friends because they all helped you. I think games like that also teach us a lot about trusting God because we can't always see where God is leading us. But the Bible promises us that God always cares for us and says to us, will you trust me? That's what God says to us. Will you trust me? Will you trust that I love you and that I care for you? And will you follow where I lead you? Today we'll be hearing more about Joseph in the Bible. Some pretty scary things happened to Joseph, but he kept on trusting God, even though he couldn't see where it was all going to go. And God was always with him, always, helping him to trust and have hope and be loving, even when he was having a hard time. I think that's a great way to be. Not giving up, but trusting God. And trusting that God will bring good to you and bring good to other people through you. I think that's great news. And here's something even better. That story is about Joseph, but it's also about you and me. It's about all of us. God is always near you. And God wants you to trust him so that no matter what happens, you can have hope that he will bring good to you and bring good to other people through you. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for loving us and giving us stories to encourage us. Help us to trust you no matter what so that we can have hope that you will bring good to us and to other people through us. Amen. And now let's all sing, God is so good.
our reading this evening, or this morning, I should say, is from Genesis chapter 50 and beginning at verse 15. And it's the story of Joseph reassuring his brothers once again. So let's listen for God's word to us through this scripture. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, <clears throat> your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended harm to me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what, what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The death of Joseph. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children also, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land, to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110. And they, after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Amen. May God bless to us this reading from his word. I've told this old Chinese story before, I think, you may remember it. One morning, a farmer finds that his one and only workhorse has broken loose and has taken off during the night. It's a big loss to him and his 20-year-old son, who is also his only son. His neighbor said, what bad luck? The farmer replied, good luck, bad luck, who knows? A week later, the horse returned, bringing a herd of wild horses with it. The neighbor said, what good luck. The farmer replied, good luck, bad luck, who knows. The farmer's son worked at breaking in the wild horses. One day, as he was riding one of them, he fell off and broke his leg. The neighbor said, what bad luck. The farmer said, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Shortly afterwards, war broke out and the recruiting sergeant came to draft all the fit young men into the army. The farmer's son was disqualified on account of his leg and left to recover and work on the farm. His neighbor said, what good luck? And the farmer replied, good luck, bad luck, who knows? On the one hand, at times events can seem really random. And we can say, that's lucky, that's unlucky. But I'm sure you've heard the saying, there's no such thing as a lucky coincidence. There's only God incidents. Or my dad used to say to us, don't be talking about luck. It's not luck, it's divine providence. And I have to say, over the years, I've understood more and more of what he meant. Although it's not always obvious how this is so, 
or that God is in control. It's a matter of trusting. And often, in fact, we only see God's hand at work when we do choose to let our eyes be opened by trusting. As God's people, we're called to be communities of trust and hope and love in how we deal with each other and bring that faith, trust, hope, love into the wider communities where God has set us. We see that in today's reading, how Joseph's faith shows up in trust, hope and love. Having been sold into slavery by his own brothers, Joseph could well have despaired. Someone else might have been sustained by thoughts of their loving family, but Joseph couldn't really think such thoughts. He couldn't dream of his caring brothers pulling out all the stops and trying to rescue him somehow. He couldn't even dream about how much they would be missing him. And maybe he would have started looking back a bit and wondering if his own behavior had somehow alienated them. You know the kind of thoughts we all have when we're going through a tough time. Despair is a temptation. I think it's helpful to recognize it as such. Last week I spoke of how in ancient times, before there were distinctive military armies or army uniforms, uh, in the midst of a confusion of battle, soldiers got their bearings by looking for their captain's flag and following it so that they were able to be led by their true captain, who hopefully cared for them, rather than accidentally finding themselves siding with the enemy who was trying to destroy them. It's really important that we recognize that despair is a temptation. It is the enemy's flag. It's a trick of the enemy. God calls us to trust not in circumstances which can change so easily, as we all know from the pandemic. God calls us to trust not in our circumstances, but in his presence with us through thick and thin, including the pandemic we're going through right now and all that goes with that, but also any other personal circumstances we are going through. Even in the dire trauma of being sold by his own family into a life sentence of slavery, Joseph chose which flag he was going to follow, as it were. Shunning despair, wrong flag, not going there. And despair was very tempting and would have seemed very logical in his circumstances. But instead, he looked for the other flag. He chose trust in God even in such terrible circumstances. He must have faced the same choice again when he was imprisoned unjustly. Once more, he chose trust in God and shunned the temptation to despair. And then later, when he found himself in high office, again, he chose to trust in God. If you think about it, on the one hand, high office brought him great honor. But on the other hand, it brought him enormous risk. Can you imagine the jealousy of all the officials and courtiers in Pharaoh's court? At this nobody, this foreign nobody, former slave, wasn't he? Prisoner? What is he doing being given greater status and authority than us? And what huge trust in God Joseph had to have to implement very tough policies that surely must have been unpopular, requiring that 20%, one-fifth of all produce be stored up in government stockpiles for seven years? You know how hard it's been when we've been told six months. Seven years? Can you imagine all the growling and the complaining that there must have been? 20% of my produce again this year? He must be joking. It's been the same for the last three years. 
and I hear it's to go on for another two years, to tide us over some famine that's supposed to be coming for seven years, and not a sign of famine anywhere. In fact, the very opposite. Can you ever remember having had such good crops? You know, I think this foreigner is getting in there and trying to destroy Egypt. And can you imagine Joseph's prayers? Lord God, am I really doing the right thing? There are a lot of complaints. Please guide me. And I will keep trusting you. As Christians, we can learn from Joseph to choose to trust God's guidance and shun the temptation to despair by encouraging each other in every way we can, worshipping in the ways that are available to us, and phoning each other and seeking opportunities to be kind to neighbours nearby and far away, not remembering those who are in very dire straits because of poverty around the world. Joseph also chose hope. Trust leads to hope. Hope isn't the same as optimism or wishful thinking. Nor is hope about things that we can see or can figure out by our own logic. As the letter to Hebrews reminds us in chapter 11, faith is trust in what we hope for and assurance about what we cannot see. When we trust in God, rather than in agreeable circumstances or in our own ability to predict and control, uh, we find that God is with us in our struggles. And his presence gives us the sure and certain hope that doesn't dim even when times are bad. As Christians, let us trust and let our trust lead us to the hope we have in God who never abandons us and who will not let us be plucked from his hand. But most of all, Joseph's story tells us of the power of God's love to give us a future where no future looks possible, where we can't see any future open to us. How did Joseph manage to choose trust and to have hope when he must have been so sorely tempted to give up? Well, Joseph chose to believe that God loved him. It's a choice. The feelings may follow, but they're not always there at the start. Someone once said to me, at the end, God will ask, did you trust that I loved you? Joseph opened his life to God's love, a choice which led to life that wasn't automatically going to happen anyway. In fact, his almost certain future was that he would suffer as a slave for a few years and then die and be forgotten. And indeed, his people were likely to be forgotten as well, to die out because of famine. But instead, Joseph chose to love even those who abused him by slavery. And as Joseph chose God's love, he was blessed as God blessed others through him. First it was Potiphar. And surely Potiphar must have been so impressed and touched by Joseph's loyal service that he must have intervened to ensure that Joseph was not executed for the crimes that he was falsely accused of, but instead imprisoned. And then all the prisoners and the staff in the jail where Joseph was held were blessed through Joseph as he was put in charge of managing them all. And then, of course, Egypt and all the surrounding lands were blessed through his austerity policies at a time of plenty, which must have seemed crazy and been very unpopular. And finally, living in God's love enabled him to forgive his brothers fully, completely, absolutely. Clearly, long ago, 
He had let go of the bitterness which could have poisoned his life. And through trust and hope, the fruits of God's love in his life, he had been blessed and had brought God's blessing to many. In today's reading, we see the really big picture of the new life that God gives through trust and hope and love. Having let God guide him to save Egypt from famine, now through him again, God reaches to save Israel, to save the children of Abraham and Sarah. And in the final verse of today's reading, Joseph's hope and trust in God's love points away, away, many generations away into the far distant future as he asks that his body be embalmed so that it can eventually be carried back to the land of God's promise. Clearly, Joseph trusts and hopes with a sure and certain hope that this will come to pass. As we struggle on with our circumstances of uncertainty and difficulties, may God's Holy Spirit prompt us in choosing to shun despair and instead to choose to follow our Lord in hope and trust and to live in God's love. Encourage each other in these things. And let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign and that your will prevails, that we cannot derail your plan of salvation for the world. Help us to choose to live not in false certainties of our own limited logic, nor in despair, nor in fear, but in trust and hope and love. And our prayers for others as well as ourselves. Lord, thank you that even with the restrictions, we can always worship you. Whether physically in the same place or not, we are together in you. Thank you that you treasure us and want our love. Keep our hearts restless till they find their rest in you. Keep us close to you, to each other, to our neighbours and to this world that you love so much through our worship and our care of each other. We pray for the government and all governments that they may make wise and generous and caring decisions that enable life to prosper and help us all to stay safe. Help us to remember that we all belong together, that we need to care for each other, nearby and far around the world, and to be ready to share the resources you have generously provided for all of us. We pray for our mission partners, for resilience, patience, and creativity, as they work to bring your love in word and deed to some of our poorest brothers and sisters. Thank you for the staff of our care homes as they serve the needs of residents and those in difficult circumstances and carers who visit homes to enable people to stay safe in their own home. Bless all in our hospitals and all medical staff as well. And bless those who are working with young people and children in schools and help us to find ways to keep teaching and reassuring children and young people of your love and care. Bless all families, especially those under stress of any kind. We pray that parents would be able to help their children to know your love through their own love. And as restrictions increase again, we pray that all of us would be patient and wise and considerate of others in doing all we can to reduce this, the risk of spreading the infection during the winter months. Lord, help us to remember that our peace and fulfillment in life doesn't come from our circumstances, but from knowing that you're with us through it all. Keep us close to you, trusting, hoping and loving all our days on earth. 
Thank you for everyone who's helped us to know your love through their love. And may we live life to the full in the sure and certain hope that this part of life is part of your greater eternal life with you and all whom you have already gathered to yourself. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And again we sing, there's a wideness in God's mercy. daily life trusting and hoping in God's love and the blessing of Almighty God Father Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever and ever Amen